Well, good morning. Great morning, church family. Uh, things don't always go the way you plan. Maybe they never do. Maybe it's God's plan to do the things He wants to do. So we can trust in that, right? Uh, so, uh, as you can tell, it is not Mike that is up here this morning. Uh, he's feeling under the weather, so prayers for Mike. Um, so, uh, my name is Joe. I got in trouble for not introducing myself last time. Uh, my name is Joe. Um, uh, so, it is Memorial Weekend. I wanted to acknowledge that before we get in, into the, the service too much. Um, you know, it is a blessing to live in a country like we do, where we get to come together and we get to worship the way we want to worship, where we want to worship. And we have to remember that that came with a sacrifice. You know, God's hand was on the men and women who have fought for this country and have let us be where we are. And I know that for me, because I know that I have heroes in my life that I celebrate on Memorial Weekend, that I always want to remember the blessings that we've been given, and that is definitely one of them, is that we have this wonderful free country that allows us to do this, and, and the sacrifice of those who got us where we are. So um, anyway, I want to say that before we... That and I didn't have an introduction for my sermon because I wrote it so fast. Uh, <laughs> The beginning of my, my the title of my sermon wound up being my first point. So, um, you know, I, I I often struggle with contentment because um, sometimes we just kind of get kind of bogged down with life, and we kind of start thinking that uh, maybe life should be better than what it is, or maybe we weren't handed the the hand that we think we should have been, or whatever reason we want to have a little pity party. Um, Sometimes that's just kind of the way it is, and um, as as believers in Jesus and as faithful followers of God, we have to realize that we do have a way of having true contentment. And so today I want to talk about understanding true contentment in Jesus Christ. So the first verse I'm going to talk with, about is going to come from Philippians, so if you have Bibles and it's pretty short, so I'm not going to make you hop up and, and I mean, we'll, uh, there'll, there'll be more than one verse. So, uh, Philippians 4, 12 through 13, and it'll be on the screen. Um, so in Philippians it says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I have learned the secret of, face, of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We've heard that one often, that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We hear that one often. Another translation says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty, and that I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Whether we're fed or hungry, whether living or in plenty or in want. So, our faith in Christ enables us to experience true commitment regardless of our circumstances. That means that we can be joyful and at peace in every situation knowing that Jesus is by our side and that his strength will, will carry us and sustain us through all the situations in our life. And I know that a lot of times it's hard to keep track of that like we we kind of lose that that thought in our mind where it's like oh is it really there and is he is he there all the time is he there in every situation he is we just forget because we're human and we fail i fail um daily uh probably hourly minute by minute there's a failure every once in a while i'm going to say most minutes um, but that's why we have grace through Christ. But we have this society around us, this world around us, that has a constant message that tells us that we should be comparing ourselves to others and that we should be uh, 
in competition with you know, the Joneses next door, or whatever, it ha- whoever your neighbors happen to be, you're competing with them because you want to see who has more. I have more. I feel better because I have more. I feel successful because I have more. Whatever it is, we're bombarded with these images and advertisements that we need to have more or that we should always be striving for something better, that we don't have enough, that we're not enough. But we have to remember that in the midst of all of that, even if we feel overwhelmed or discouraged, or we're driving home from work, this is mine, we're driving home from work and we drive past a house and we think, man, that guy's got a nice house. I'd like to have a nice house. Man, he's got a couple of nice cars sitting in the parking lot. They're newer than mine. They're better than mine. They look better than mine. I'd like to have some nice cars in the parking lot. He's got a boat. I don't even have a boat. Where's my boat? But then we're falling into that comparison trap where we're comparing ourselves to other people. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know what kind of debt they're in. We don't know what life they're living. We're living our life. God commanded us to not want the things that our neighbors have. We're not supposed to covet those things. His stuff or his wife, any of the things that we don't have, we think that he has that might be better. We are to be happy with what we have. Because the more we compare ourselves to others, the more that we take that time and start playing the comparison game, the more unhappy we will be with the blessings, the true blessings that God has given us the amazing things that we can wake up every morning and say, God has given me a day to live. God has given me a house, the roof over my head. God has given me something with four wheels that I can drive to work. God has allowed me to have a job that I can go to because I know people that don't have jobs. I know people that are struggling. I'm blessed. It's a beautiful day. So when Paul offers us that perspective of, I know what it's like to be in need, I know what it's like to have plenty, we begin to learn the secret of being content in every situation. So we have to look at first, contentment in Christ. Paul acknowledges that he has experienced both abundance and scarcity in life. And he knows what it's like to have everything that he needs, and he knows what it's like to want for basic necessities. I mean, you think about Paul... You know, he's walking around trying to get the word out about Christ. Some places they're stoning him and thinking he's dead. Some places they're arresting him and putting him in in jail. He's He's having to depend on other people for everything that he has. Now, he did have a job. He was a tent maker. And he would do that job when he went places as he was preaching and teaching. But he was still having to rely on others to keep him alive with food and things like that. So our our contentment in Christ does not come from external circumstances, but from an internal relationship with Christ. That's the thing Paul had. He walked with Christ. He had the, the amazing opportunity to actually meet Christ on the road to Damascus. Such an amazing opportunity that it blinded him. But we also have this relationship. Paul learned satisfaction through fulfillment in Christ alone rather than material possessions or worldly success. And we have to recognize that fulfillment also. For followers of Christ, we have to find true contentment by shifting our focus from things of the world to the eternal promises of God. We place our trust in Christ and seek to align our desires with his will. So, how can we do this? The last part of that verse talks about doing all things through Christ who gives us strength. We cannot overcome this world of you need all this stuff on our own. Because if we start walking around thinking we can do these things on our own, we will fail. I know that whenever I start thinking I've got this, that's when I've got to start thinking maybe I don't have it. I know that strength in Christ is the only way that I'm going to get anything done with anything that I'm doing. And so, Paul's speaking about finding strength in Christ to endure any situation. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
He acknowledges that he is able to face anything, abundance, scarcity, famine. He can face anything if he has Christ. Oh, I went too far. Yeah, I'm messing with Aaron. That's the one I want. There you go. All right, so as believers, we're, we're called to rely on Christ for that strength. We're called to do that. We're supposed to be surrendering our fears and doubts to Christ. We have to surrender the things that we have to Christ's care and control. He equips us with the strength and resilience to, to overcome these obstacles. All we have to do is give up. We just have to say, it's not my will. It's yours. Less of me, more of you. We just have to give up. That sounds bad, right? So we're, we're, we're winners, right? We're not, we don't give up. But if we could just give up ourselves, get past our pride, lay that down, and cling to him in times of di difficulty, he will provide us with courage and perseverance. So the next thing we have to do is let go of our earthly desires in exchange for eternal salvation. Colossians. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things, not earthly desires. It can be tempting to seek contentment in material possessions, relationships, or achievements. I know that sometimes we want to just... If I can just do the thing that will make the person happy, then they'll be with me and I'll be happy. Or they'll stay with me and I'll be happy. Or, you know, I have to keep my wife happy so that I can be happy. But all those things, I'm not saying the wives are just things, relationships and achievements are earthly. And then we have to find our true relationship with Christ setting our, our minds on heavenly things, prioritizing our relationship with him so that we can experience a deep and lasting satisf satisfaction that goes beyond all those earthly pursuits. And I know today we have a world where everybody says, okay, so I need to, I need to make sure that I am going to all these places. I need to go to the concerts. I need to go hang out with these people. I need to get the kids in sports. I need them to play all these sports. I need to make sure that I get to college and I, I study the right thing so I can get the right job and I can have all this, all these earthly pursuits that, that pour on us. We're bombarded with this social media work, personal concerns. All of those things are of the earth. And that in Colossians, he says, we have to put our minds on the things above. So what does it mean? to set our minds on things above. So we have to align our thoughts and our values and our priorities with the kingdom of God. We have to align our thoughts and values, our priorities with the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. And in that verse, he says, seek first and it will be, it will be given to you. But we have to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. We have to fix our eyes on Christ. Seek the kingdom of God. Set our minds on things above. We're choosing to focus on eternal truths, God's love, his faithfulness, heavenly eternity, the finished work of Christ on the cross. These are the things that we have to keep our eyes on. This perspective enables us to see that these little challenges, little struggles in life, although they seem large when they're right in front of us, they seem huge. You know, whenever you hold something right in front of your face, everything else seems quite small compared to that thing. You know, I can hold my phone up. I can hold my phone up and put it right in front of my face and I can't see people that are out in front of me. 
My phone is smaller than they are, but when it's right in front of my face, it's bigger than they are. We have to be focused on the eternal. So what are the benefits? Benefits of setting our minds to things above. There are a lot of benefits for the spiritual walk and well-being. It helps us to maintain a heavenly perspective, allowing us to navigate life's ups and downs with faith and hope and peace. That faith and hope and peace that safeguards us from the distractions and temptations of the world and keeps us focused on what truly matters in the eyes of God. By setting our minds on the things above, we can experience greater intimacy with God in a deeper sense. God wants a relationship with us. He's called us to that relationship. He wants us to be close to him in every part of our lives. Our desires and ambitions being aligned with his will and that that life will be pleasing to him and it bears fruit and glorifies his name. So, how to refocus. We have to refocus so that we can practically set our minds on things above. Set our minds on things that must, must, must be intentional. We've talked about that a number of times this year, being intentional. We have to be intentional with our thoughts and actions. Spending time with prayer and studying God's word. Meditating on spiritual truths. Surrendering our will and submitting and letting the Holy Spirit into our lives. That's one of the hardest things that we can do. When we sit around and we start thinking, well, I'm, I'm just going to do what I have to do to get things done. And then every once in a while I'll pray whenever I need to. And I'll, I'll you know, crack the Bible just to knock the dust off of it every once in a while. We're not being intentional if we're doing those things. And I know for me, it's, it's, I, it's a busy world. It's a busy life. You know, we have to find time to set aside to be intentional with our thoughts and actions and our time with God. We also need to surround ourselves with other followers. You know, in Hebrews it says that we're not supposed to give up corporate worship. We're not to give up this. We can't just stay home and say, well, I'm going to worship God from home or I'm going to go, I'm going to go out and, you know, walk by the lake and, 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 see the beauty of nature, that's a wonderful way to worship, but that's not going to encourage and support our faith journey like surrounding ourselves with other believers, believers, if I can get my words out. By participating in corporate worship and serving in ministry, engaging in worship, we're able to strengthen our spiritual walk and remain steadfast and setting our minds on things above. Whenever we serve others, Service to others. That's one way that we can set our mind on things above because we're putting ourselves aside and say, well, I'm going to serve others and spend time with others in fellowship. Embracing gratitude and trust in Jesus for a fulfilling life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It was like the beginning of that. It reminds me of the, the rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh -huh. Gotta love that song. I, 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 you know, all the little songs that we sang when I was young um, pop into my head whenever I'm reading through the Bible because most of our songs have some kind of Bible verse stuck in them somewhere. And so whenever I hear that song, I just, that, just it, that, that verse just pops into my head. That we are to rejoice. We cultivate a spirit of gratitude and trust in Jesus. That we can say that we are happy. By rejoicing always, praying continually, and giving thanks in all cir circumstances, we align ourselves with God's will, and, it, and we can experience a peace and contentment in our life through these things. We have to remember that true contentment comes through our relationship with Christ, not from things of the world. We have to think about 
we have heaven ahead of us. We have earth in front of us. We have heaven ahead of us. Earth is all around us. We don't have to worry about the bigger house, the nicer car, or the boat. Because when we get to heaven, well, we'll have the big house. He's already built it for us. He's prepared a place for us in heaven. We've got the big house. It's in heaven. We don't need a car or a boat because we can run without growing weary. Or if we really want to, just mount up on wings like eagles and fly. We don't need the things of earth if we can just keep our eye on heaven. So there are three basic commands to rejoice, to pray, and to give thanks in 1 Thessalonians. So the first one says to rejoice always. Rejoice always. It might seem like an impossible task, especially whenever there's challenges and trials and loss. But we can find joy in all of our circumstances, not just when things are going well, but whenever things get rough. It's not about putting on the fake smile and giving the, hey, how are you doing today? I'm great. Fake smile. It's not that. It's about choosing to focus on the goodness of God and the hope we have in Christ, even in the midst of pain and suffering, knowing that our joy comes from God and it's bigger than any trial that we may face because we know that God is always working for our good. We strive to rejoice always and remember that joy is a choice. We can choose to dwell in our problems and choose to, to sit in our anger and stew in the things that we just don't like that are happening. Or we can choose to fix our eyes on Christ and find joy in his presence and embrace that joy that comes only from knowing him. The second thing that it says is to pray continually. Pray continually. Prayer is one of the most powerful tools that we have. That God has given us this tool that allows us as believers to speak to him. We're called to pray without ceasing. Bring our worries and needs before him in faith. But also bring our praises so that we can pray when we're worried or have problems and we can pray whenever things are great. Prayer is our lifeline to God. We get to communicate him and gain guidance and wisdom from him. Of course, that means that prayer is not just me talking. It's a communication. It's a conversation. So it includes being still and quiet and listening. And it's not just reserved for times of desperation and crisis. It's not a break glass in case of emergency type thing. It is a daily discipline that we have to cultivate in our lives, seeking God's guidance in everything that we do so that we pray in the morning when we wake up. We pray and ask for his blessing in our life and ask for him to guide us. And then we pray during the day as we are going through our life. And then we pray again at night, thanking him for getting us through the day and asking him for another. The last thing that he commands, the little thing there, the three commands, give thanks in all circumstances. Gratitude is a powerful force that can transform hearts and minds. Gratitude helps us see the blessings that are around us. even when we have trials. Giving thanks in all circumstances also is not about ignoring pain or suffering in our lives. We can't walk around saying we're not sick when we're sick. We're sick. We can't rock, say my leg's not broken when it's broke. It's broke. We're not going to walk around saying everything's hunky-dory just to say that it's hunky-dory. But we can be thankful because I prefer a broken leg over other things that could happen to me. And I know that we have the ability to fix it. We have the amazingness of our medical community that can come and, and make us feel better when we're sick. 
Even if we have a sickness that goes for a long time, we can manage that. And we can be grateful that we're able to actually get through life. It's about choosing to focus on the ways God is working through us, even in our darkest times. And we give thanks and acknowledge God and his goodness and faithfulness. As we strive to give thanks in all circumstances, we have to remember that gratitude also is a choice. We choose to focus on problems and complaints, or we can choose to count our blessings and give thanks to God. I hope that I can cultivate a heart of gratitude knowing that God has always working. He's always working. And that he is worthy of my praise. And that I am a work that is not finished. And that one day he will complete my work, the work that's in me. He is doing a work in me. And one day, whenever I get to heaven, that work will be complete. And he will be able to look at me and tell me whether or not I did a, did a good job. <laughs> And that's the report that I want. That's the thing that I want. Success in my life is for when I get to the end of it, I get to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. All of the rest of the stuff that I do in my life, the amazing things that I'm proud of, I have my children, my grandchildren, the, the things that I do on a daily basis, people that I talk to, lives that I've, I've those things are very small and compared to me having God look at me and say, well done. Do I know today whether or not that would happen? Sometimes I'm, I'm, that's what I struggle with. I'm Maybe, I hope, it is my hope. We are to work towards that. Our hope in salvation. My hope and prayer is that we can have true commitment in Jesus Christ. And that as we go through our daily lives, that we can focus on the things that are above. And that we can give thanks in all circumstances. And that that would be a roadmap for us to live our lives in joy and in the fulfillment in Christ. Not just for our benefit, but for the glory of God. That we can do all things for the glory of God and his advancement, the advancement of his kingdom on earth so that we can bring others with us whenever we get to heaven. So I'm going to pray and have our team come up. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for the amazing blessing that it is to be here today. Father, we, we're just so grateful that you've given us the opportunity to live the lives that you've given us. I pray that we look for your will, your hand in our lives. I pray your hand over the people that are here, the people that have joined us online. I pray your hand on their lives. I pray that you will guide them and that they will listen. Father, I'm so grateful to all the amazing things you've given me. And we are so grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.